guys, today I want to talk about the unequal heating and the rotation of Earth and how this will end up determining regional climates. Um, regional climates, another way to think of that is just the average weather a certain area on Earth experiences. So average, average temperature, just a set area experiences. There are lots of different climates on planet Earth. So the number one thing, let's talk about the Earth, okay? Let's talk about the rotation, the spinning of the Earth. The Earth does spin on its north and south pole on its axis. Um, and this, will this simple turning will affect not only the atmosphere, which we'll consider any air particles, whether they're very close to the Earth or very far away, not only affects those air particles, it also in, actually ends up affecting the oceans. Um, this rotation also actually affects the distribution of land, ice, and living things. So the sun will give Earth energy in the form of solar energy. Um, and this will give everything on Earth, whether it's the air, the land, the water, ice, will give everything a certain temperature. What's interesting about the Earth, though, is though we are spinning, as previously seen, um, we are tilted on our side. So what's interesting as a result, since we are tilted, some parts of Earth actually will get that sun energy in a much more smaller area versus a much more spread out area. So if you were to take something and spread it out, obviously it's not going to be as intense. So if I were to take a marker and I were to color a one by one inch square versus a one foot by one foot square and I had the same amount of time, I gave you 10 minutes to color, one of those squares is going to be colored a lot more intensely than the other. The sun is the same way. If it's spread out over a smaller area, it's going to be a lot more intense. Whereas those areas where it kind of hits at an angle, the sunlight is not going to be as intense. So generally, what's interesting, what you can see from this chart right here, this gray line is the equator. And what we have here is the temperature scale. These orange colors are actually our warmest average temperatures. Whereas as you work towards orange and yellow and green, those temperatures start dropping off in averageness, if that's a word. Um, so as you can see, generally the warmest place on earth is going to be the equator. And what's interesting, if you think about it, if the sun is more intense there, it's going to start causing more evaporation. If you remember from our water cycle assignment, Evaporation is just the sun warming up water. Water will evaporate, turning into water vapor or water in the gas state. Um, and this can cause clouds to start to form. So right near the equator, there are a lot of areas on Earth that have a lot of rain. Um, warmth and rain, you guessed it, there's a lot of tropical rainforest in these areas. What's also interesting, though, is that these typically occur right on either side, almost like a bubble right next to the equator. What's interesting though, on the other side of those bubbles, so further north of the equator or further south of the equator, generally is where we find some very dry climates. So what's really interesting, since the equator in tropical regions, if you will, so if you could create a whole band of pink, right where you see all this pink at, um, What's interesting is that we can start to develop some predictable patterns. Um, and these patterns result in generalized, these consistencies, the equator being the warmest, um, will result in some patterns in our climate um, caused by just simply more direct sunlight at the equator and less at the poles. Um, which affects our winds, the movement of the air, um, which results in a thing called global winds. So next, let's talk about land and water. Um, there are some temperature changes that result um, in land and water. So water is a slow conductor of heat, which means it takes a long time to make the water molecules jiggle at the same speed and have a set temperature. 
Um, land, it does not take as long for those molecules to jiggle at the same speed. But what is interesting is that water does store heat better than land because it has a greater density. So water molecules are packed closer together than land particles or molecules are. So therefore, if you've ever been to a swimming pool um, in the early evening or even at the beach, the surface around the water, so the concrete around the pool or the sand, it's going to cool off as the sun becomes less intense. But if you dip your toes into the water, the water is still warm. So water will actually store heat much better than land. It just takes it longer to get there. If you've ever boiled water, you probably understand this completely. It takes a long time for that water to boil, but once it is warm, it's going to store that heat a lot better. So now I'd like to talk about altitude and temperature and how those two things are related. So if you'll think about it, some mountains that you look at and see, if you've ever been to the Rocky Mountains, for instance, sometimes even though it might be the middle of August, you can look at the top of those mountains and you can see snow. What we want to think, though, is we might know that top of mountains are cold, but the top of a mountain is also closer to the sun. So how does how far away you are from the surface of the earth have anything to do with temperature. And what that requires is you to think at the molecular level of the air. So I want you to imagine those air particles. So as you get farther from the surface of the earth, those air particles are given more and more space. So if we think about it, the sun will shine through the atmosphere and the atmosphere will gain thermal energy as the sun shines on the air surrounding the earth. But as it gains energy, those molecules and those particles are going to start jiggling more and moving around more, which means they're going to obviously spread out more and bump into each other less. The atmosphere is a huge area. If you look at the comparison between the surface of earth and Mount Everest, and then the edge of the atmosphere, which at the end of the atmosphere is then outer space, the amount of space in the atmosphere is vast. It is large. So as you actually move away, those air particles, they'll spread out more and bump into each other less, which results in a lower temperature. Remember, temperature has not only to do with how much those particles are moving, but also how many particles are there. So it's not just how much movement there is, but also the more particles there are and the more that they're moving, the higher the temperature. So let's talk about how the solar energy, how it transfers once it gets to planet Earth. So as you can see, if we were to look at one incoming solar radiation as a one, um, about 29%, so almost 30% is automatically reflected back into, this, into the atmosphere. That's either reflected by clouds, atmospheric particles, so anything that might be in the atmosphere. It could even be bright ground surfaces like the sea, like ice, like snow. So of the remainder, only 23% is absorbed by the atmosphere. So that air, 23% of the air, so water vapor, dust, ozone, those things are gonna get warmed up. So after those two arrows are absorbed or reflected back, the only thing that's left is about 48%. And that amount, so less than half, actually gets absorbed by the surface of the earth. So once the surface of the earth starts absorbing that thermal energy, we have to think back to how this is going to start interacting with our ocean water and just our air and our atmosphere. Um, fluids will want to move from a higher density to a lower density. What that means is fluids, so both water and air, will want to move from a place of very high compactedness meaning there's a lot of stuff in a very little amount of space, to an area where there's lots of space between the particles. So they want to move from close together to spread out. Cooling water down means the molecules will jiggle and move less, and they'll end up moving closer together. Whereas heating water up 
makes those molecules jiggle more and they will end up spreading out further. So some things that affect the motion of wind, air, and ocean currents is the Coriolis effect. This is just simply an effect, a uh, thing that makes planes, air, and water appear to move in a curved path while they travel long distances on the planet Earth. So first we have to think about a few things. The Earth is always spinning. Obviously it's North and South Pole are where it spins. Um, but we also need to think that the Earth is a sphere. And since it is a sphere, it's going to be smallest at the top and the bottom, and it's going to be widest or roundest right at the middle since the Earth is a sphere. So what that means is different parts of Earth move at different speeds. So at the top, at the north or the south pole, it's going to take 24 hours only to make a six foot circle, and that is in circumference. So that's the outermost edge of this circle is going to be six feet. So if you can imagine a six foot circle right beside you right now, that's how far the North and South Poles actually spin and rotate in 24 hours. Whereas if you were to look at the equator, which is the middle of the Earth, the widest part of Earth, it's going to take about 24 hours for it to go 25,000 miles. And that's a whole way around. So it's a belt around the Earth that's 25,000 miles, a much bigger distance. So the speed difference is drastically different. At the equator, you are moving 1,040 miles per hour. That's, that's faster than I've ever been. Um, and then at the North and South Poles, you're going less, a fraction of a fraction almost, of one mile per hour. So simply because these two things move at different speeds, because no matter what, the whole Earth is going to make one full rotation in 24 hours. So say I have a magic paper airplane, and when I throw this airplane, it goes a far distance. I can throw hundreds of miles. So think with me here, plant your feet in Texas, and I want you to look northward. And I want you to imagine that you're gonna throw your paper airplane north. Okay. Now, if we think about those, we're probably thinking if we throw it north, hundreds of miles, we're probably gonna land in Nebraska, right? But what you have to think about is that you are actually further south. So where you are standing is actually moving a little bit faster than where you're gonna end up throwing. So both you and the paper airplane are actually moving faster than any place that you plan on throwing it to, okay? So that means your airplane won't actually end up in Nebraska. Since you are moving faster, you and that airplane are moving faster by the time you throw your airplane you're already moving faster so obviously everything you throw is going to curve to the right so your airplane would actually end up somewhere closer to delaware if you were to stand on the equator and look south and you were to stand in a city in south america and throw your airplane you would have to think you're still spinning to the right Okay, you're still spinning faster, super fast, but since you are now looking the other way and you're looking at the South Pole, your airplane will actually end up moving in the same direction, but it's going to appear different. It's going to appear that it moves to the left. So to understand this, you definitely have to imagine yourself either standing in Texas and throwing your airplane north or standing at the equator looking south and throwing something further south. Simply because where you and the airplane are at and when they're thrown is moving faster, it actually makes it appear to curve and move in a curved path. So let's talk about the geographical distribution of land and how this limits where ocean currents can flow. So ocean currents are just ocean that moves ocean water that moves. There are a ton. Um, some water is going to be colder, some's going to be warmer. As you can see though, as before, 
If you stand at the equator and you look south and you try and throw something, it's going to curve to the left. So you can see a couple instances where this happens. Or if you were to stand at the equator and look north, we can see our North Atlantic current here, or even our Gulf Stream curving, and it's following that Coriolis effect. The one thing that gets in the way and causes these arrows to kind of be in a haphazard motion is just simply the land will block the water. So where there's a continent of land, it's going to block that water and that water is not going to be able to flow around it. So it has, there are some unexpected paths the water takes. Um, one you might recognize is this East Australian current. Marlin and Dory got on that with some sea turtles. Another thing that affects atmosphere flows, and the atmosphere is made up of air, right? So things that affect the air being able to flow are things like mountains. Obviously, mountains can be very small or very, very tall. So mountains will either deflect and block weather or wind, or it will force that weather or wind to a higher elevation. And the biggest thing that this causes is those storms to just basically get stopped at the top of a mountain and those storms will work their way out. They will pour out on one side of a mountain versus the other. And what this can cause is a thing called a rain shadow, meaning that since those storms will get stopped at the top of a mountain, those storms will rain out and use up all of their precipitation on one side of a mountain. Whereas the other side of a mountain, since it's on the other side and the earth turns in one set way, meaning it will never get a chance to work its way over. So if you are in a valley of a mountain, meaning you have mountains all the way around you and they stop the weather from getting to you, that means they end up getting all the rain. You in the valley of all these mountains would not get the rain. So all the mountains on the outside would be receiving that rain. You would not. The atmosphere. So the atmosphere will actually produce the fastest change of thermal energy compared to either land or water. The atmosphere will change temperatures so easily simply because it can contact both land and water. Since it can contact land and water, it causes convection. So the sun is shining, convection occurs, um, and convection is the most efficient way to transfer thermal energy with a liquid or a gas. So the atmosphere is in contact not only with land, but water as well. Um, it causes a really easy way for heat to be transferred, which actually causes some pretty interesting climates or average weather um, throughout the globe. So there are some places, they're in green here, um, that actually have, um, they're near large bodies of water, and they will actually have smaller changes in their temperature compared to land that's not close, um, which results in heat being exchanged easier, um, which results in fewer temperature swings, meaning they have more consistent year-round temperatures. So their summers are a little cooler, their winters are a little warmer. Um, their temperatures don't, just don't drastically go up and down like they can in Missouri at times. In these places, you're generally not going to see a 90 degree day followed by a snowstorm, whereas you would see that here. So there are places on earth where the weather is a little more consistent um, and a little more nice, a place honestly I would like to move to. <laughs> uh, this wraps up our discussion of the unequal heating of earth and the rotation of earth.